is this year thanks in part to the Directors Guild of Canada, our supporting partner, and our media partner, Now Magazine. We also want to thank all of the donors, the members, uh, perhaps people like you today for supporting TIFF's charitable mission, and that is to bring the power of film to life all year round. You know, when I was working as a film critic uh, back in the last century, uh, I saw Catherine Hardwick's film, 13. <laughs> people know 13? I just saw somebody outside with a VHS tape of 13. Is that person in right, right now? Amazing. Um, when I saw that film, I was floored by Evan Rachel Wood's performance. Her teenage character changes the most in that film. She has the hardest transformation to make, and she's brilliant. And she's continued to be brilliant. Working with directors as varied as Julie Taymor in Across the Universe, Darren Aronofsky in The Wrestler, and George Clooney in The Ides of March, we've watched her evolve as an actor who's utterly convincing across the emotional spectrum. We're honored to have presented 10 of her films at the Toronto International Film Festival. And fortunately for all of us, she's also done some of her best recent work in Canadian films. Two years ago, she co-starred with Ellen Page in Patricia Rosema's Into the Forest. And this year, she stars in Jason and Carlos Sanchez's debut feature, Allure, which premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival back in September and is now a part of Canada's top 10. In fact, it's playing right after this conversation, just next door in Cinema 2. Most recently, Evan has been a part of the small screen revolution that we're all witnessing, acting in the hit series Westworld, in Alan Ball's vampire drama True Blood, and in Todd Haynes' miniseries Mildred Pierce, all for HBO. Roger Ebert wrote, once wrote that she has emerged as a young actress who can bring an eerie conviction even to tricky and complex scenes. Conviction. That, I think, is the hallmark of Evan Rachel Wood. We've got a couple of examples of her work I want to show you before, her br before we bring her out. This is from Into the Forest and True Blood. For instance, how does he know I'm having you sell vampire blood? The guards hear everything. Your Majesty, I'm sorry. There's no way he could... That is really bad. He does not know that you are supplying it. He better not. I'm holding you responsible. There they are. Aren't yours lovely? You may be the strongest, oldest vampire in my kingdom, but if I wanted, I could own your fangs as earrings. Understand? I want to fill the generator. What? Let's fill the generator. Right now, before it gets too dark and we spill some. Why? So I want to see mom and dad. We can watch home movies, and I can put music on and dance. <laughs> Look, we can't. We have to save it for the Jeep. But there's like five gallons in here. We only need two to get to town. Yeah, and two to get back. Okay, so four. That leaves one for right now. Sorry, no, we, we have to save it for an emergency. I need it. You don't need it. Come on. This is our life insurance. Our life insurance. Yeah? Ours. Half mine. Yeah, of course it's half yours. Everything's half yours. Okay, you know? then I'll just use mine. No, because what's left over won't do any good, okay? No, we need to save it for when we really need it. Stop. Stop. Please join me in welcoming back to Toronto, Evan Rachel Wood. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Evan, uh, the suit is amazing. Can we Thanks. just say that right away? Do we agree? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Um, it's, um, it's remarkable in a way that you have done two very um, strong Canadian films. You grew up in a theater family, originally from North Carolina. How did mm -hmm. you end up making your way so far north? Um, my, uh, my father runs a theater in North Carolina, uh, and that's actually where him and my, my mother met doing uh, plays together there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when they had me and uh, my brother, we just kind of were raised in the theater because they were always acting there. My dad was always directing, and I started doing musicals and um, Shakespeare and uh, and then... What age did you start doing Shakespeare? I'm I did curious. Midsummer Night's Dream when I was seven. Seriously? I was cobweb. Oh my <laughs> <laughs> um, and my mom was Helena and my, my father directed the production. So it was always just kind of in the family. And, um, you know, that's just the language that was spoken in my house. My parents were obsessed with acting and filmmaking and actors and so certain things were just blasphemy mm -hmm. if you didn't know about them or hadn't seen a movie or mm -hmm. a performance and uh, so it was just, I feel like I was more bred to do it than, than you know, going, oh, I, you know, I think I wanna be an actor and then going after it, it was just what I did and then um, uh, a lot of things were being shot in Wilmington, North Carolina at the time and, um, and my, my family knew these casting directors there. And then one day, I, I still remember it so clearly, my mom got a phone call from them and they just said, don't you have a daughter? She was like <laughs> around four. She said, yeah. And she leaned over and she went, Evan, do, do you want to be in a movie? And I went, okay. And you hadn't really acted up until that I, point? I, 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 I had mm -hmm. a little, but no, I was four. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and, then, um, um, and that was it. Really? That was it, and then I started. And you just caught movies. the bug from there. Yeah, and then I just kept auditioning, and then I moved mm -hmm. to LA when I was nine. Um, yeah, and um, <laughs> pretty much consistently have been working since then. Wow. Twenty-five and years. Twenty-five years. Twenty-five years. And I've you been are acting. still a young and person. I'm Thirty. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not many actors your age have a quarter century of experience. No. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and and the, the first time you, you uh, acted in a Canadian film, was that with Patricia Rosema with uh, Into the Forest? Or had you done other things? No, you know what? I think that was, yeah, that was, mm -hmm. that was my first. Mm -hmm. I was surprised, actually, because uh, most of all the other actors I know make their way up here at some point or another. But yeah, that was my first one. Mm -hmm. um, you were quoted at one point saying, I don't remember a time when I wasn't acting. Yeah. And I guess I wonder how did that particular childhood, really growing up in a theater family and with acting all around you. How did that shape the actor that you are today? In a big way. Um, it's funny, the, a, a lot of comments that I get now, I think because I've been doing it so long from filmmakers, they say, oh my God, you're so professional, you're so focused, you know all your lines. And I just went, isn't that what you're supposed to do? <laughs> like, and I guess like, I don't, I guess not anymore. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but and I and I talk to young actors now, and um, uh, some of them drive me crazy because they 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 don't watch movies. They mm -hmm. haven't really, they don't have a film education, or uh, you know, they're not well versed in in that world. So I think that really gave me like a leg up, and it really um, helped me fall in love not just with acting, but just film in general. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just the ultimate way to express myself. I was a really really shy. Um, but also really hyper. I had a lot of energy. I was always performing, but I had nowhere to kind of put it. Um, and so it was wonderful for me. I could, I could say everything that I always wanted to say in a safe space, and it was where I worked out all of my drama. <laughs> you know? So it was great. You, you mentioned that not all actors that, that uh, are working right now might have the, the, the film background that you do. When you're creating a role, are you thinking of film references as well? Do you have movies in mind or performances in mind that you're kind of bouncing off of? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, I, I listen to a lot of music to kind of get into a role. Every time I, I, I'm given a new one, I think that's one of the first things I do is I go through my library and start picking out all the mm. songs that I feel like are gonna invoke the right vibe or emotion. Um, and yeah, and sometimes I watch um, a lot of film. I know for Allure, uh, there were a few movies on that list. Uh, 
Lolita was one of them. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> I watched Humbert, Humbert. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, mainly for certain moments, like, mm. I, um, because uh, sometimes I'll read a script and something will remind me of something and I'll go, oh, that, that actor in that one movie, mm. in this one moment, uh, played this emotion in such a beautiful way. And so I can go back in my Rolodex and kind of like mm. go back to it. I also have a really weird memory and a lot of people yeah. comment on it when they work with me. I think some people have like a photographic memory, but mine is with sound. Oh, really? So I can kind of see a movie once and never forget it and remember really? it word for word. All the dialogue mm -hmm. in a whole movie. Yeah, it's like, kind of Like which movies sick. do you know? Um, all the dialogue. I'm just curious. Like by heart, by heart front to yes. back, clue. Yeah? <laughs> word for word, <laughs> clueless. Oh yeah, okay. Um, but I don't know a lot. And some, some I might not think that I do until I start watching them and then I just- And then you're doing all the I lines. Start. Yeah, people had to tell me to stop talking during the movie. <laughs> now I want to watch a movie with you. This sounds Do very you? interesting. <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe once. Um, so you grew up doing this, and then at a certain point, you begin to get those teen roles. And I want to show a couple of clips from... Oh are, you, are you ready for this? Yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> is it weird, really? It's, it is weird. Okay, it's not that big a screen. <laughs> Just kidding, it is. Um, the, the first time I saw you on screen was in a film called 13 that Catherine Hardwick directed. Yeah. Terrific performance, Thank you. working with Nikki Reed. And um, we also have one from when you were a little bit older, I think you might have been around 19 or 20, uh, The Wrestler. Oh yeah, 20. Um, with Darren Aronofsky, which um, played at the, here at the Toronto Film Festival. Yes. And I think in both of those cases, you are playing daughters who are kind of finding their own identity uh, a few years apart. So we want to look at these two clips and then we'll come back and talk a little okay. bit. You don't have to look if you don't want oh, to. <laughs> 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 Let's look at those clips from 13 and The Wrestler. What is that? Don't worry about it. Let me, let me see that. No. Mom, what is it with you and poking me? Mom, stop! Me What the hell is that? I'm talking to you. It's a belly button ring. Speak up, I can't hear you. It's a belly button ring! How else can I say it? I don't speak no other languages. Oh, and you wanna know what that is? That is a tongue ring. What did you do all this, baby? <laughs> oh, Mom, 2,000 years ago, I'm a mummy, I was born 2,000 years ago. Tracy, I'm really starting to lose it. Stop it, please. No bra, no panties. No bra, no panties. Stop it. No bra, no panties. Calm down. Do not judge me. I'm sorry. I hate you. I know. I, fucking hate I know you. you hate me. I know you do. I know you hate me. Calm down, listen. You know what? I don't care. I don't hate you. I don't love you. I don't even like you. And it was stupid to think that you could change. I can't. I can't. I don't care. Come on. There is no more fixing this. It's broke. Permanently. And I'm okay with that. It's better. <sighs> Sorry, I'm really sorry. I don't ever want to see you again. Look at me. I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear you. I'm done. Do you understand? Done. Get out. There's so much there in both of those performances. Um, <sighs> let's go to 13 first, because that was a groundbreaking film in a lot of ways, I think. And the first time I think we'd seen you, Nikki Reed, and Catherine Hardwick. Holly Hunter, of course, we knew from the piano oh, and many God, other yeah. movies. 
uh, but incredibly intense emotionally, and I think a lot of parents' worst nightmare uh, in terms of <laughs> teenage daughters who just, you know, they're living their own lives. Um, what do you remember about how you created that character? Because she's the one who, who, be, who starts the movie as a kind of a fairly innocent, naive girl, and then meets uh, Nikki Reed's character and totally changes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I remember when I first read it, uh, turning it down. Really? <laughs> Why is that? Um, because I think I was really skeptical uh, that they would do it right. Um, and I was scared. I was scared because it was so intense. It was such mm. a huge risk if they got it wrong. Yeah. And um, I guess I was just a really cynical teenager and um, you know, just thought, no, they're not gonna get this right. And then um, my agent said, you know, Catherine Hardwick really, really wants to sit down and just go talk to her. And I was like, all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I went and I sat down with her. And again, I was really shy and you know, I was a 14 year old girl go on my own journey, going through a lot of stuff. And, um, and I, she talked to me like I was a real person and really wanted to know what was going on and seemed like she understood and she cared and I felt seen. And then she showed me this mood reel uh, and it was so beautiful and, and different. And, um, and I completely changed my tune and fell in love with the project and fell in love with her. And I walked out of that meeting, I immediately got on the phone and I said, I have to do this movie. It's so important. Um, and then, um, yeah, and again, I film education. I, Holly Hunter was like a god in mm -hmm. my house. Mm -hmm. So that was just completely overwhelming and cool. But like watching that scene again, I'm, I'm looking at it going, I wouldn't be able to do that now. I, really, like, why not? It, I mean, Sometimes when I go back and watch stuff from when I was a teenager, I miss the just how pure it was. I, there was no, no one really knew who I was. There was nothing on my shoulders. There was no pressure. It was just about the work, and um, and sometimes it's hard to like get back into that zone now. And and you know, especially the older we get, the more shit gets piled on <laughs> and that we have to shed. And there it was just so uh, raw and. Um, yeah, it's just, it's crazy to go back and watch. You were 14, you said, when you were making 13. Um, what kind of technique would you have had at that age? What kind of formal training? I had, um, I had started going to acting class uh, when I was around seven. And then after I moved to LA when I was nine, I was going uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Uh, I was homeschooled, so mm -hmm. that was my school. And that's where I had all my friends, and we all kind of grew up together in this, this acting school. Mm -hmm. um, and my mom taught there, so on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I would watch the adults. And then after a while, uh, the other acting teacher there would throw me into the scenes to prove a point to the adults. Huh. When I was like 10. What, what <laughs> kind of point would that have been? That she's 10 and she's better, do oh. better. Like, <laughs> like, uh, you were um, showing up the grown ups. Yeah, which was always really <laughs> awkward. Um, but, uh, and, but that's where I learned. And then um, I learned, it, it was uh, kind of like the Meisner technique there, I guess. Um, can you just explain what that is for those who don't know the Meisner technique uh, I mean, briefly, I don't if you know. can? Uh, <laughs> it's, well, I don't know. What we were taught in acting class was acting is just listening. That's right. all you got to do. Yeah. Um, you have to learn how to open yourself up, feel, and just listen and react how you would react. And, um, and also breaking things into moments, um, breaking down the script in a certain way. It also helps you kind of learn the lines and um, not never acting what you don't understand, mm -hmm. um, doing your research. Um, and uh, like I think if you did a scene and you said a word that you didn't know and you got caught, you had to pay a dollar. Like really? Yeah, That's like you just really had to know yourself. Um, and then we would do things to kind of learn that thing that kind of can't be taught with another actor, which is when you kind of go to this next level. I think we were kind of talking about it backstage about how you said you know when you watch actors sometimes it just seems like magic, and I think mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like that for us because mm -hmm. when you what you strive for is to get to a place where you completely lose yourself and it's just really happening, and you you work with these other actors and you get to a place and sometimes you barely know them but you're bearing your soul to these people and you connect and you see this person and you you're getting a glimpse into their soul in a way you don't know where it's coming from but you know that there's something there that's very real to them. 
and you're connected forever and you share that space and that moment and nobody else does and nobody else can explain what happened mm -hmm. in that moment except the people that were there. And so in a way, it definitely feels like magic sometimes. So we would do exercises like having two people face each other and you both close your eyes and then, um, or no, I'm sorry, one person closes their eyes and one person opens them. And you have to open your eyes the second the other person closes them. Ooh. And it's like this weird, it just to kind of get people connected, connected in a, yeah. to the things that we can't see. Hmm. And it worked, it was, it was creepy to watch. <laughs> <laughs> but we get these great performances yeah. out of it. Um, the Wrestler is another interesting one. That's, that's a, perform, uh, a movie, really, composed of performances that all feel very true, very authentic, very in the moment, in the way that Darren uh, and his cinematographer shot the film as well. Oh, the, you so know, the camera was just sort of prowling and following yeah. the characters. Do you remember about shooting that particular scene with Mickey Rourke? I do. And how that was done? Yeah, well, Darren is, um, Darren's brilliant and really cares about the actors and um, he wrote backstories for all of us. Mm -hmm. Like you don't really, you know, my character's really only in about three main scenes in that movie. Um, otherwise we don't really know a lot about her. So yeah, before we started, he sent me a big backstory. We had meetings about it. We had meetings about her. Um, I never spoke to Mickey. Um, that was kind of his process. Mm -hmm. So we didn't talk in between takes and I didn't meet him until we were filming our first scene, mm -hmm. that was my first meeting with him. And your characters are estranged father and daughter yeah. as well, so maybe that was part of the reason I why? I think so, okay. yeah, he wanted to kind of keep us separate. Huh. Um, and then on that day, uh, I got all ready for the scene and there was some technical difficulty, so he's like, we're not gonna be able to shoot for like a couple hours. And I was like, okay, so I had to kind of stay mm -hmm. there and uh, got exhausted and Darren had to come, I was like, Darren, can you just come to my trailer really fast? I'm like dying over here. Uh, so he came and he sat with me and he talked to me and kept me in it. And then, um, yeah, it, that was just one of those scenes where it just felt completely real. And um, if you look at my body of work and if you knew anything about my life, I think you could see how certain roles really just coincide and fit perfectly with kind of what mm. I was going through at the time. And I think that's true for a lot of actors because subconsciously we just kind of gravitate towards those roles because it's, for resonating with us in a way when we read it and we're like, mm -hmm. oh, I feel something, I know I can, I can bring something really real to this. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, uh, I actually sliced my finger open when we were filming that scene. I'd read that, what happened? Throwing things at Mickey. <laughs> uh, and I picked, and like I was ch chucking stuff and you know, you're, was, my adrenaline was up, I was so in it and I grabbed a can and I threw it at him and I guess I squeezed it when I held it in my hand, because oh. then all of a sudden I was doing the scene and I thought soda had gotten on it because it was really wet. And it's not soda. And it was blood oh. and um, it was an independent movie and it's like, well, we either stop filming and we don't get the rest of the scene or we can glue it. <laughs> and glue then your finger. I was like, what? And I look over <laughs> in the corner and there's Mickey Wark just like. <laughs> <laughs> gonna do <laughs> and I was like glue the finger like <laughs> glue it like so we did <laughs> and then we kept, and you going. kept going yeah um, amazing but Mickey is definitely one of those people that is just so present and giving and um, just killed this role and you could just tell even on set that he was just throwing himself in it completely and mm -hmm. it was really cool to to act opposite him because mm. again I grew up watching Mickey Rourke and Angel Heart was right, like another yeah. one that was like on the mantle of performances. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yeah, it was cool. Um, I asked Darren Aronofsky about working with you on, on that film. And the two things he, he mentioned right away were your focus and your preparation <laughs> um, and how you could react and respond to anything that was thrown at you. I, th I think he mentioned a scene that uh, you just kind of improvised in a, a place in Asbury Park. You yeah. just kind of found the place and kind of <laughs> yeah. made something out of it. That's right, we did. Yeah, the scene where Mickey and I dance mm -hmm. in the abandoned um, park. Uh, and it's funny because when Darren first came up to me and said, so I think you guys are gonna go in here and like, what if you just start like waltzing around? And I mm. laughed, I was like, that's <laughs> stupid. Um, and he was like, no, I'm serious. Like, you guys should dance. I was like, Darren, no, what are you, no. You don't waltz around, that's not good. Um, and then, uh, this is why Darren Aronofsky was Darren Aronofsky, because um, he was totally right. And so we just went in and 
it turned into this really touching, emotional, kind mm. of beautiful, it's beautiful. scene. Yeah. Um, because when you really, because when you step back and you go, okay, but what would really be going on in this scene if this was this was happening? Once we started talking about it, it was like, okay, now I know what to do. Um, doesn't seem so stupid anymore. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, uh, whether you wanted to or not, grew up in front of us on screen, and your roles began to to shift from those girlhood roles and those roles of. Um, teenage rebellion to <laughs> actual adult uh, roles. Um, and you know, most of us get to hide our awkward teen years, but I think you probably had to use that somehow <laughs> in, uh, in your performances. Yeah. What was that like? Interesting. Um, but again, I think like, um, like before I did 13, I was on this TV series, Once and Again. Yay, it's <laughs> Once and Again fans. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks. And um, I actually just went back and, and rewatched it, which was a completely different experience now that I'm a divorced parent. Mm. I was like, this show was so good! <laughs> 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 like, just, <laughs> just weeping after every episode. Wow. And then twice as weird to see little me and then knowing what I was going through and, like, seeing it mirrored in the role. And, but it was just the best therapy. You know, I was playing an awkward teen on a TV show and I was an awkward teen. Mm. And weirdly enough, my awkward teen was struggling with her sexuality, just like on the show. <laughs> I don't know how they knew. Um, so it was uh, amazing. It was amazing to get to be given the language mm -hmm. for what I was feeling, because I think at the time, I, it's so hard for us to put what we feel into words and then to be in the hands of those writers and then to be with those actors who are just, again, they just became my family. It was like the best master class to, to do. And then right after that, I did 13. Hmm. So I was, my muscle was strong. really strong at that yeah. point, yeah. Uh, a few years later, you uh, acted in what I saw as really the first time I'd seen you play an adult role fully, and it wasn't a kind of a transitional phase in, in the character's life, and that was in The Ides of March, oh, yeah. directed by George Clooney, and uh, uh, playing opposite um, Clooney, and especially Ryan Gosling. Another Canadian. I know. So there's a connection <laughs> there as a through Ryan line. Gosling. <laughs> uh, um, um, and you play an intern on a political campaign, uh, and we've got a scene I want to show and then come back and talk a little bit about that uh, transition in your career. Yes. I worked with you in Iowa, actually. Oh, uh, that's right. You changed something. My hair? You changed your hair. No. Oh, I see. But yeah, I look like a real dumbass no. right now. Huh? No, not at all. You're the big man on campus. I'm just a lowly intern. Oh, it's not like that. You get to stay at the Millennium. Okay, they put us at a motel on the other side of the river. You're right. I am the big man on campus. And now you're starting to see. Mm-hmm. We do have a better bar, though. I've heard that. You should come by one night. Have a drink with the worker bees. I might do that. I might do that. It's a good night. Tonight's good. Tonight. Tuesday night. Yeah. It's quiet. Quiet's good. Will you have my number? I do. It's programmed right there on your phone. Aha. Uh -huh. Under Mary? I know your name is Mary. <laughs> my name is Molly. You are so playing with him. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, Ryan. Yeah, I, I love that scene in particular um, and your whole performance in that film because you are in control. You are just an intern <laughs> on the political campaign, but for a lot of the movie, you're just like running these guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, was that on the page or how much of that were you bringing to it? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was on the page, and I think George uh, really loved having fun with me and Ryan and, and getting me to make Ryan feel as sheepish as possible <laughs> most of the time. And then, yeah, and we, we would improvise, uh, improvise a lot, too, and Ryan's really good at that. Um, so, you know, the whole scene where we're tying the tie and that whole joke, because oh, yes, it's just, right. I just started doing that. And, and then you uh, say, I don't know, I have yeah, no idea how to tie yeah, a tie. Yeah, that was just right. us. Um, <laughs> so, and then, you know, the, the Philip Seymour Hoffman and... Paul Giamatti and all these just amazing actors. And Jeffrey Wright, who mm. would 
make a cameo on later right? in my yes. life. Yeah, yes, yes. I was forget that we did that movie together. Um, it was great though. I when I got the script, yeah, I was really excited to to be playing um, a slightly more mature uh, young lady. Um, and uh, getting op- yeah, being able to act opposite Ryan, you know, it's just like, I never, I mean, I did, I got, I got the Ryan Gosling thing, <laughs> trust me, but, like, but it wasn't until I, I, I worked with him and, you know, sometimes when you're just around that person's presence and their energy and then the way they work, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, you're, you're James Dean, I got it, mm. yeah. Mm-hmm. You're really, really good, <laughs> really good, yeah. Um, there's a kind of a, what I saw in this movie and, and your performance, especially, there's a real interiority in that in that role in that performance that that maybe is less in the earlier ones when you're younger and you're kind of acting outwards because there's so much emotion and energy and change mm-hmm. going on. And this time, you really got to see what's behind the eyes of your character. Mm-hmm. Is that a different kind of uh, technique that you need for that? Yeah, I think that's actually harder. Yeah. It's it's so much easier to just be able to let all your emotions out and cry and be uh, messy and hysterical, but I think um, playing those moments where everything is bubbling underneath, you're just on the verge of tears or you're holding something back, that's the hardest, that really is, because you have mm-hmm. to kind of stay in this purgatory place mm-hmm. all day and be there fully emotionally but holding it back at the same time. It's That's been one of the hardest things for me to try to perfect as mm-hmm. an actor. And sometimes it's really there, and sometimes you're like, come on! <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but I've learned, um, and I think I've just gotten to a place in my life where it's just, it's, uh, I think doing my own self-work, breaking down my own walls, has actually made me a better actor. It's given mm. me easier. A lot of people think if you are too okay that you're not a good actor anymore, and mm. I don't actually believe that, because I don't think, because no one's exempt from pain, and I don't think the things that happen to you ever go away, but you can be more in touch with them and understand them more, and I think when those walls are down, you actually can access them much easier. Um, so I forgot where I was going with this. Um, just You just alluded to something that is interesting to me. It, it, some actors think that the more messed up you are, the better an yes. actor you are? Really? I don't think that's true. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, doing my own self-work, I think, made it... Uh, easier to access those things so that, and just life experience. So now when I read a script, it's much easier for me to be like, oh yeah, no, yeah, I know that feeling. Yep, yeah, oh yeah, I can draw. Definitely draw from my real life for this one. <laughs> um, and then you've got it. And then um, and then I try not to think about it until we're doing it. And I've gotten to a point where I like to do a close-ups on the first take. Oh, really? Yeah. Why is that? Because it's really hard for me to hold back. <laughs> <laughs> once I'm in the scene, huh. and once I'm saying the words, if I hear them, and if I'm even close to feeling the emotion I'm supposed to, then it's mm-hmm. just, it'll all just come out. I can't mm-hmm. hold it back. And you don't want that in the close-up? Yeah, I want that, in, want the close that up. in the close-up. I want that in the close-up. I want, because, okay. well, I want the close-up to, because that's the one that's going to be the most real for me. Because it's the first okay. time, right. so it's, it's the most, sometimes the most honest. Sometimes mm-hmm. it takes you a few takes to get in there, but... Mm-hmm. For the really emotional stuff for me, it's like, just put the camera on me and roll, let's go. Like, right. I'm there. <laughs> so, it's sometimes a director's job to know when you've got the performance, you've got the scene, but you must also know when you haven't quite hit where you want to get to. What's that like? It can be deceiving. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's such a great feeling when the way you feel on set matches up with what you see on screen, and you're like, mm. yes! Mm. Yes! <laughs> oh, I felt it, and I can see it, and it's there, and it's amazing. And then there's sometimes... I've had experience where I walk away going, yeah, man, I felt that, Mm -hmm. I crushed that, and then I watch it, and it does not translate to film. And it looks like I'm not feeling anything. And I was like, wow, I really must have just been feeling it (laughs) and actually not communicating it. Um, And then sometimes you think, God, that wasn't very good, and it turns out to be great. So Mm. um, we're our own worst enemies. And yeah, some, you know, you you do what you can, you do your best, and then it is in somebody else's hand. And... Mm. I usually like to get at least one take in there where I, I feel good about it, even if it's not what they use. I know right. that I've done the thing that I, huh. I felt like I needed to do, and, and then I'll, I'll start playing around. But. And do you watch the footage on set as you're shooting? No. Um, a lot of, most of the time, there isn't any time. Right. Um, playback slows things down. Um, it depends on the movie. Uh, Westworld, no, because we're shooting on film. So fast as well. Yeah, yeah. and it's, oh my God, and so And you're shooting fast. that series on film, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I like to hear that, you know? Yeah. Film we, still lives. Film, yeah, it's alive and well. I love the way it looks, too. I'm yeah. really happy that they did yeah. that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a kind of a thread that I think in these these transitional roles from teen to, to adulthood, which, which is a, a tricky one, I think, especially for a woman who's in this business. Um, in this film, Ides of March, your character, you know, that's a light, funny scene, but has a kind of a tragic end. Yeah. Um, and then to go back to 13, and then another film you did called Pretty Persuasion, where you're, <laughs> in each of these cases, you're really playing with that sex and power intersection, right? right? And I think for young women, that must be an especially charged place to be as an actor, because you must be getting roles that are coming at you with varying degrees of success in terms of how they've figure that out, right, how they navigate it. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, as you were choosing roles at that age, uh, particularly as you're figuring yourself out, mm -hmm. what was going into how you decided what kinds of roles you wanted to choose, what parts of your own process and, and growth you wanted to put on screen? Um, it was funny, um, you know, when I did 13, I was really craving something that I related to. Um, there wasn't a lot of movies being made about teenagers that felt real to me, and that's why I, I did that. And then when I got older, um, and I transitioned into more adult roles and got into that kind of early 20s phase, I suddenly realized that every script I was being sent was uh, to serve the male lead or to just be the the love interest or the sex symbol, you know, it'd be like, oh, cool, I get to come in and have sex with the lead actor and then I'm dead. Cool. <laughs> All right. right. Um, and yeah, I did that. Yeah, a lot and then movies. I was done. I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I did it. Um, and I liked uh, Molly because she was, um, that's the other thing. We, we wanted to, it was important for us to make sure that she was uh, kind of the one controlling the situation, even though she's, you know, still very young and, and naive. But, um, uh, so I just had to dig a little deeper for roles that spoke to me more and were more representative of, of the women that I knew. Um, and I, <laughs> I, was, I was married to an actor for a while, and he got sent a script once, and he was like, I can't even believe this. Like, it's just such a bad role. It's like my only reason I'm in this movie is to serve the female character. I'm just like a love <laughs> interest. And I went, yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to my to world. My world. Yeah. But it really made him go, oh shit, like, wow, that is what you get all the time. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, especially when you're that age. It's like when early 20s, like, we don't know what to do with you. Just go have sex. Mm -hmm. Be pretty. And you're like, <laughs> what the? Um, so so uh, I did, yeah, I had to dig around. And I, I did <laughs> throw some comedies in there uh, occasionally um, and some musicals. But um, yeah, for the most part, I guess I gravitated towards more kind of edgy stuff and more dramatic stuff and um, because it just felt, I don't know, more real. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where I found the more interesting characters. So and more colors to play with and yeah. depth. And um, so that's what I looked for. And huh. that's why when Into the Forest came around, I was like, oh, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for this. It was such a gift. And like for it to be me and Ellen, especially like two peers, we never really get to work together. Because again, it's usually like one girl. And a guy. And a guy. Right. Um, so to actually be like paired off with somebody that like you admire mm -hmm. and respect, and you know, mm -hmm. that was really, that was fun. I, I want to do that more. Good. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes said that it's only in television where you find the, the stronger, more complex roles for women and w where women have more power as creators as well, you know, going all the way back to Lucille Paul and Mary Tyler Moore to Jennifer Aniston and Oprah and Shonda Rhimes and, and you know, there, there are so many these days. And you've done some terrific work uh, on uh, what used to be called television. Um, for <laughs> <laughs> it seems like a, a, an inadequate word now. You yeah. Know? Um, but Mildred Pierce, True Blood, Westworld, all for HBO. How do you see the differences in terms of what's available to you on for that screen and that kind of storytelling as opposed to what's in Hollywood for movies? Um, well, uh, it's also been interesting being in the film industry when, yeah, we were still using film. We still used Polaroid cameras, mm. and no one had cell phones, and <laughs> we still somehow got movies made. <laughs> uh, and then to see the transition into digital, and um, technology's being slightly different, the cameras start to evolve, uh, the process evolves, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, more people are watching TV now, 
um, because of streaming and uh, downloading and, you know, to see the game change so drastically was really mm. kind of amazing. Uh, you know, asking people, so, so yeah, okay, so what, what do I need to do? And they're like, you need more Instagram followers. And you're like, that's how this works now. Wow, okay. And that is how it works now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now there's like a lot of pressure to have followers mm -hmm. on, on social media so that you can get jobs. It's like, that didn't used to be the case at yeah. all. Um, but, uh, 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 oh yeah, TV. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, in my experience, I have noticed that because television can take its time, um, you get uh, more developed characters. And I don't know why um, there's better roles for women on, on television, maybe because there are more women behind the scenes, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, I, 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 I'm really not sure, but um, it's been a blessing. And HBO has been a blessing, because I do believe that that's not TV, it's HBO, because they really <laughs> always take it above and beyond, and they mm -hmm. love me for some reason. They sure do. And yeah. I keep coming back, and they always kick my ass, mm -hmm. um, just because the work is always so intense. And um, but uh, but it's, it's it's always so good, and I'm always so proud of of the product. And so I hope they have me for as long as mm -hmm. I'm around. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a couple of clips I want to show from Mildred Pierce. Uh, where Todd Haynes, great filmmaker, uh, went back to the, um, the Joan Crawford film from the 1940s and made it as an HBO uh, limited series. And then Westworld, I think probably a lot of you watch Westworld. Is that fair <laughs> to say? Yes? Um, so let's look at these two clips. This is uh, first from Mildred Pierce, where your character, um, who plays Kate Winslet's daughter uh, in the show, um, and uh, is also a, a, a musician, a singer, an opera singer. And, and this is a scene where she's got some frustrations with her manager, but then realizes that she, he's got some good news for her. And then Westworld from season one, where your android character, Dolores, describes the murder of her family. Let's look at these clips from Mildred Pierce and Westworld. Sewed to pleasant cigarettes. For an entire year. 500 a week is nothing to sneeze at. It's true, dear. That, that's still a great deal of money. Mother, that's not the point. There are levels in this business, and we just had the chance to move up, and we missed it. Do you have any idea what New York means to a classical singer? If Levinson had looked ahead two minutes and not jumped on the first boat that came along, if he hadn't been so greedy... Hey, hey. Now, suppose you take it back. Suppose you say you're sorry. Why should I? It's the truth, isn't it? Because I got an offer for you, and this you're going to want to hear. What offer? The Philharmonic. Headliner. The Philharmonic Auditorium? Why, that's marvelous. Big time. <laughs> then accept if the terms are suitable. Not so fast, baby. It's kind of a double offer. They'll take Pierce or they'll take Opie Lucas. They leave it to me. I handle you both, and Opie, she don't cuss me out. She's nice. A contralto's no draw. Contralto gets it if you don't apologize. Okay. Levy, I apologize. Dolores. Yes. Do you know where you are? I... I'm in a dream. Before this, do you know what happened? My parents... They hurt them. Limit your emotional effect, please. What happened next? Then they killed them. And then, I ran. Everyone I cared about is gone. And it hurts. So badly. I can make that feeling go away if you like. Why would I want that? The pain? Their loss? 
It's all I have left of them. You think the grief will make you smaller and sad, like your heart will collapse in on itself, but it doesn't. I feel spaces opening up inside of me, like a building with rooms I've never explored. Do you ever have a director say, limit your emotional affect, please? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a great concept and must be especially interesting to act the different layers that are in Westworld. Oh my goodness, yeah, it's so much. Uh, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, especially season two, actually, because she's even more complicated, if you can mm -hmm. imagine. Uh, How much can you tell us about where we are? Oh with my God! Um, wow, you are really, really in for it. Um, <laughs> I had I no idea. Ask. I thought, you know, God, where are they going to go from here? How do uh -huh. they top this? First five minutes of the first episode, I was like, oh, they've, they've, uh, they've done it. <laughs> um, I care about this show so much, and this character, I've just grown to love so much. Um, and so coming into season two, I just was like, God, I just want to do her justice. She's um, going on that journey with her was just, I know I speak about her like as the third person, but she really is kind of like this other entity that I just pay my respects to. Um, when I put on that blue dress, just kind of something happens and mm -hmm. I definitely disappear. Um, actually, when season two wrapped, I didn't want to take it off. Really? Yeah. I, I took my wig off and then just kept walking around set in blue dress. <laughs> and they were like, do you want to change? Like, mm -hmm. No, no. We are one. Uh, <laughs> um, what is it about that character that, that grabs you that way? Um, it was amazing to get, what, what's amazing about Westworld is that, and, and the hosts, and I think what separates it from maybe other sci-fi movies or movies about AI is that we're always um, told to be as human as possible so that you care for them and that you can relate to them and to be given a role that is literally just the good parts about humanity. And Dolores is just the most pure, innocent, um, big-hearted, passionate uh, person um, so to be able to just play these pure emotions and just open up and just let in the heartbreak and the love and the wanting to see the good and everything, it was just, um, it was amazing to have permission to do that. And then while at the same time masking this other layer, or many layers of her, um, has everyone seen the show? Because I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so then, you know, later on finding out like, oh, and you are another character as well. Mm. Uh, and they're gonna kind of come out every now and then. It was like, oh, oh, what? Because <laughs> um, they didn't tell us anything going into the show. So I didn't know, I really didn't know what all the layers are gonna be. And then once it started unfolding, I, I realized I was just on such an extraordinary show. Mm. Um, and you're not getting the scripts all at, up front you're shooting out of sequence sometimes. So are you constantly surprised by what Dolores is doing? Um, yeah. Season two, especially, we, we shot out of order. Uh, so sometimes I was doing scenes from episodes I hadn't read. Uh, and they were just like, OK, here. Uh, and you're like, why do I have blood all over me? What did I do? What? What? Is, what, are you, what? <laughs> and they're just like, you've been through some stuff. Just go that way. And you're like, I had a. So that's <laughs> nerve wracking wow. as an actor. Yeah. <laughs> Because your whole job is to kind of build an arc with the information mm -hmm. you have and go, okay, yeah, and this is where the turn happens, and like, and then I'm gonna hold this back, and then I'm gonna take it mm -hmm. to 10. And, but in this, they just, it's a really interesting acting exercise, and I really think the only reason they're pulling it off is because they have some of the best actors out there working on this. Incredible cast. On Incredible. That show. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're really given, you know, in a situation like, okay, I'm doing a scene from an episode I haven't read, you have to show up to set and say, what happened right before this? And they'll, 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 they'll kind of get, paint you a picture. And, okay, what's right about to happen? And they kind of paint you a picture. And then you go, okay. And so you have these parameters that you can work inside. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't get too creative because you might do something or think you got a good idea. And then someone will come to you and say, actually, that's not going to work. And we can't really tell you why. But like, you wouldn't <laughs> do that. And you're like, okay, I guess that's not okay. Um, 
So it, it, I described working on season two as being on the deadliest catch boat while being a contestant on Chopped. Because <laughs> <laughs> what we're doing is really dangerous yeah. most of the time. Like, I show up to work, I put on a really heavy costume, real bullets, uh, a Colt 45, and I'm riding around on horseback in the desert all day. Like, that's pretty cool, mm -hmm. but really dangerous. Um, <laughs> and so we're doing that usually in crazy conditions, harsh conditions, crazy locations, either extreme heat or extreme cold. I'll never forgive them for not riding me a jacket for season two. <laughs> Um, but you're an android, you don't need a jacket. Yeah, right, which is why the shivering really doesn't work. Yes, exactly. Uh, and so, I, uh, my meditation this season was you're warm, you're warm, you're warm, you're warm. Um, Does that work? Uh, for like two seconds. <laughs> um, but, uh, so yeah, so, but that really keeps us in the moment. Like, you, you, all you can do is focus on the task at hand and where you're at and do the best version of what you think that is and have faith in the writers and the people guiding you, which I do, luckily, because they're just extraordinary people and brilliant minds. Um, but it is uh, not easy. Hmm. No, not at all. <laughs> um, you're pretty good at Taekwondo, right? Yeah, I'm a black belt. Yes, <laughs> not a lot of people know that. Um, and you also, you're a musician yeah. as well. Um, you've got a lot of skills, I would say. And I would have imagined that at a certain point in your career, given your background, your acting training, your skills, um, the current climate in the movie world, that you would have been approached to do superhero movies. You'd think, right? You'd think. I know. Was that ever something that you wanted to do? Or? Dude, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Who would you have wanted to be? I'm just curious. In the <laughs> Marvel or the DC or whatever oh, universe. Oh, man. I don't know. I'll just choose one of the guy characters. All right. But um, I don't know. Well, when I grew up, I was a huge X-Men fan, okay. actually. Like, mm -hmm. me and my brother used to watch that cartoon all the time. Mm -hmm. So, and I was always rogue. So, okay. right. I, shout out to Anna Paquin. She's my girl, and it's hers, man. But, mm -hmm. like, that was, that was the one that I liked growing up. Okay. Yeah. Um, you've instead found incredible work uh, in, in films, uh, a lot of great independent films. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering what they're giving you um, that maybe Hollywood movies, which are so dominated by superheroes now, what do you get from an independent movie that you dominated might not be able to get? Dominated by superheroes and men. Yeah, um, <laughs> right, talk about that. <laughs> and I love men. Like, like and it, yeah, there's crazy things going on in the world right now, but it, it's, it's been happening, and it's not as shocking to us, because you know, we've, we've been in it. Um, but it, it's not, it's definitely not a call f against men or, or saying they're all horrible. Um, I think it's just a call for equal opportunity and to have more stories being told about women by women. Um, and uh, I hope we start to see more of that. I think this is the start of that. Um, Do you see signs already uh, that Me Too and Time's Up have led to? More opportunities for women who want to tell stories on screen? Um, well, I've been trying to get a film made uh, that I co-wrote for a couple years um, and that I'm planning on directing. And um, a lot of people really liked it. And then they went away. And then Me Too happened. And now a lot of them are circling back. Going, Tell me about this female-centric uh, movie that, that, that you have going on that you want to direct. That sounds good. Um, so. Uh, We'll see if it gets made, but um, I was like, oh, okay, well, now the ears are perking up again. Told you. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so I hope so, and I know that um, the women in Hollywood right now are really energized, and they're all working together, and we're all working together behind the scenes to change laws and um, to have pay disparity and um, uh, just to make things safer and more fair. Uh, we're definitely definitely working on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Patricia Rosema told us that when she worked with you on Into the Forest that there was one particularly tough scene. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a violent sexual assault in the uh, film and um, that's always got to be a hard thing to shoot and to act and she said that when you finished the scene that you spoke to the, the crew and the cast that were on set that day. Yeah. Do you remember what you said? I do. Um, yeah, I remember that day really well. And I think this was also before I had 
uh, really faced my own demons and my own past and things that I had tried to forget. Um, and I, I remember I was like, okay, I just want to have Ellen on set. Because Ellen and I were so close by the time we made this movie, because we hung out for a year before it was made, because we knew that we were going to be doing it. So we wanted to be really, really bonded. Because there's just certain things you can't fake. Um, so I was like, Ellen needs to be there. Um, and that's it. That's all I need. Um, and I was just dreading it. I was sick like the whole week leading up to it. But, um, but we talked about how it was going to be shot. And, um, and I, I, I loved the idea. She was like, we're just going to stay on your face the whole time. Because this is not to give anybody an outlet to be turned on by this in any way. Like, we're just going to see the pain. Um, and I thought that was a really good way of handling it, because I think so often we kind of skip over that. And we showed the aftermath. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are mistaken that, oh, well, it happens, but you're OK. Like, get over it. But it changes you. It does. And it sometimes can take years or lifetimes to fix these scars. Um, so, and I think that was my point to the crew that day, uh, because we shot it. We did it with two cameras. We did it in one take. That was it. I don't really remember shooting it. I remember everything going black and feeling a lot of pressure in my face. Um, but com it was one of those moments where I left my body and I don't, I just was in the scene. And mm. I don't, I didn't have to act. I just put myself there and um, had to talk with the other actor who was wonderful and very sensitive. And if anything, I felt really bad for him that day because, you know, everyone's taking care of me. And he's like, I'll just be here traumatized in the corner. Um, don't worry about me. Uh, but uh, so we shot it. I burst all the blood vessels in my eyes. Really? My eyes kind of actually popped out a bit. And I had uh, broken blood vessels all over my eyes from screaming. Um, and then they yelled cut. And I remember I just kind of crawled and couldn't see, and then all of a sudden I felt an arm around me, and I knew that was Ellen, and I just sobbed. Um, and just cried on my hands and knees in the dirt in front of the whole crew. And so I knew this was having an effect on them in some way, to see this, to, to see what we shot, and then to see me like that. And so I don't know what came over, and I just stood up, and I said, OK, you've seen it. You've seen what it looks like. You've seen how horrible it is. You've seen what it does to people. You've seen the pain. Speak up. And I was like, speak up if you know about it. If, if it's happened, just, just do something. And not because we could be your mothers or your sisters or your daughters, but because we're human beings. And no one deserves to have that happen to us. No one deserves that, is what I said. And then I kind of walked away. Um, and uh, you know, then. People start coming out of the woodwork, and then you realized it wasn't just me that day. It was a lot of people on that set. There were a lot of survivors on that set. It's never outside of the room. And when you're doing stuff like this on a movie, you have to be aware that the actors might be survivors, the yeah. camera operator might be a survivor. Like, they're everywhere. They're in this room. Um, so I think it was important for them to, to remember that and to go home having done that, taking something away from it, and maybe changing their perspective on it a bit, which is the whole point of what we do. so good we you do. did that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> you do not shy away from tough material, do you? Nope. I usually charge into it like a bull. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I think we're all the better for it. <laughs> um, the film that you're here with is Allure, mm -hmm. another tough movie. Um, mm -hmm. This is directed by a couple of Canadians from Montreal, Carlos and Jason Sanchez. And uh, we have a scene from the film. And uh, I want to show that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about this. This is, I don't know if there's anything you want to say for people who haven't seen Allure yet. It is playing later. But it's, it's a very tough relationship story, an unusual one, mm -hmm. about your character and a, um, a, a much younger woman, a girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yes, I play a, a much older woman who's uh, very mentally unstable for a number of reasons that we find out uh, as we watch the film. But it is about an abusive relationship. Um, it does just happen to be between two women. Um, that's not really what the film's about, which is a thing I kind of 
liked about it. It's that that was not the main focus. It just happened to be that way. Um, <clears throat> and it tackles the subject matter in a way that I hadn't really seen. Um, it's it's about this abusive relationship and about the victim and about the abuser, which I play, which was new for me to play mm. the abuser and to play the predator. Uh, but then you also get how somebody uh, gets to this point, which is something that I think so often we kind of forget. It's just like, well, that person's a monster. It's like, yeah, but that person was a kid once. Right. And what happened? And I think that's kind of what we show in this. And it's not to let anybody off the hook, but I think it's so that we know why this is happening and what mm -hmm. we can do to stop it. Okay. We're going to watch this scene from Allure, and then we will bring the directors out, Jason and Carlos Sanchez. Uh, I'm all done. Okay. Is your room all right? Everything how you like it? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, nice and clean. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. <clears throat> Bye. I'll see you soon. Okay. Okay. I really like your poster, by the way. Oh. Thanks. It's funny, I wouldn't have thought that you're a Nirvana fan of all the classical music you were playing before. The classical playing is just a thing I have to do right now. Oh, OK. God, could you imagine seeing them live? <laughs> be really intense. It'd be crazy. <laughs> hey, Goosebumps just thinking about it. Bye. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Disturbing, but very well done. Let's bring out the directors of Allure, Jason Sanchez and Carlos Sanchez. Welcome. Thank you for Hello. creeping us out in <laughs> just under two minutes. <laughs> um, you uh, started as photographers. And this is your, your feature debut. Terrific work. Um, I want to ask you about the role that you wrote and, and uh, were planning to make into a film, and then matching that to Evan Rachel Wood. Why her for this role? <laughs> Could it be anyone Speak else? <laughs> Could it be anyone else? I mean, that's um, that's part of the magic of of filmmaking when things kind of come together and and it just falls into place and it just couldn't be anybody else. I mean, for us, this film started five years ago and it's a bit of a long story, but um, I mean, initially when we began writing this first film, there was a male lead and it was it was much different story but you know the essence of it was relationships in which people are caught in these relationships and these invisible leashes where you 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 you're confined to them and even if there's an opportunity to escape you can't get out um you know the initial thing we we wrote was you know a more of a, a man uh, physically confining this younger girl and uh, and uh, like a 5 year relationship and the study of that but um you know, years later, when we finally got it financed and all this, um, we were having trouble casting, uh, what have you, and uh, there, was, there was a moment where, where we decided to see what it would look like if, if the lead was a female, and that was, that was a moment that was between us and our casting director, and it was kind of a eureka moment where we were like, fuck, that's... that's you know, for four years, that's the story we'd been trying to write because... You know, if, if you see our photography, wor uh, our, our photographic work, it's very much based on on, on studying the psychology of, of of the people within the images and even 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 places. You know, um, and the story we were always interested in, in in telling was this this story between two people. You know, this relationship where you're caught within this 
uh, this prison with uh, these non-physical walls, these psych psychological walls. So we, we, we rewrote the entire script uh, to, to suit a female lead. And, um, and at that moment, Evan's, Evan's name was, was recommended, and we had known her uh, from her previous work. And um, she was really one of the first people we approached. And, um, and we were so f fortunate in a way because um, I don't know who else would have taken this on because this wasn't like, it's not like uh, I'll in go the best away. Of ways. I know. That's, <laughs> yeah. it's that's not what like, everyone always says. It wasn't Dude, shooting. She's the only one that will do it. Like. <laughs> she's the only one who said yes. <laughs> but it's not like we're shooting in Hawaii and it's going to be this yeah. nice thing. This is like this really tough yeah, it was. film. Well, Evan, it was. you should you should pick you up know. the story here because uh, this is tough material. You're playing a character who's easy to hate because she does some pretty awful things, yeah. um, and yet she's compelling. And also, in addition to it being tough material, you're working with first-time feature filmmakers. Yeah. So what makes you kind of jump off cliffs like that? You know, I remember, and, you know, trying to get my own films made now. Like, I, um, I know what it means to have a vision and to know that you can do it. Mm -hmm. And you just need somebody to believe in you and to take that chance. And... Uh, Sometimes you don't land on your feet, and sometimes it's wonderful. And it's what we did with Thirteen. It's what Holly Hunter did with Thirteen. And I always remember that. And I was like, God, if Holly had not, been, you know, seen the potential and, and believed in Catherine Hardwick, that movie never would have gotten made, probably. Um, and so, and I've carried that with me. And then when I got this script, and I I was really blown away by the writing, uh, because I hadn't seen this subject tackled like this, and it really did get into the psychology and 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 the fact that it was being told through through a, a, a woman's eyes and exploring those depths that we haven't seen, I was just, again, like, yes, um, but this is gonna be awful to shoot. Uh, <laughs> and, and it was, but it was good because you guys were doing it. And when I saw their photography and I saw uh, how beautiful it was and how they made, they can make something that would normally be so off-putting beautiful in a way, I thought, well, these guys are, yeah, these guys are, are perfect and if you get the right cast in this and they know how to shoot a movie and they've written it so obviously they understand the material then we should be good mm -hmm. should be you know it's <laughs> still yeah you still yeah you don't know um still don't know <laughs> <laughs> no and when you see it it's just mind-boggling that that's their first film i mean really it's just masterfully done and especially considering that it was low budget how many days did we shoot that in 2025 something crazy um you know, the fact that, that the movie's just, it just seems like there's not a hair out of place. It's really spectacular. Um, Let me so. ask you about one other element, because uh, so much is unspoken in the film. There's a lot that's kind of just under the surface that doesn't come out immediately in the words. And that scene we just watched, when she puts her arm forward, she doesn't tell Sarah's character what, what she's doing, but we know watching it, just in, in your performance and how you shoot it, what's going on. It doesn't have to be said. So I, I want to ask all of you about creating a story and creating a character like that without words. What, what are the, the elements that you're using? I mean, I think the most interesting way to get things across is not having it said. Mm. I think, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It, you know, it takes a lot of precision. But I think uh, in terms of respecting your viewers and not hitting them over the head, I think that's the most, I think if you can accomplish that, well, then you've done something good. Yeah, and I think, didn't we even do some takes where we would say the dialogue and then some takes we would try to do the same scene but without dialogue? That's when we're running out of time at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> we got 30 seconds, just wrap the dialogue and let's just shoot this Scrap with the, the action. It doesn't matter, <laughs> <laughs> a shit. It'll seem like a choice. Right. Like, yes. <laughs> we're artists here. Yeah. Very cinematic. We uh, certainly good. cut a lot of dialogue, uh, you yeah. know, as we went along, we kind of, yeah, parsed, we realized parsed that we it didn't, as we went along. Yeah, so, yeah, that we didn't need it. I mean, that's 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 the 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 strength of the actors. You you don't need to say so much when they're bringing so much, you know, you know, their energy to the role. You know, that's that's the beauty. You write it on the page because you feel you need to transmit this idea and right. that emotion and all that. But with what they bring, it's so strong. It's better just to cut back the words and just mm -hmm. let it let it be. Yeah. 
yeah, and using absolutely. those really long takes that we did too. Yeah. So many, there's whole scenes in the movie that are just one take yeah, too, right? Yeah, that's the fun part. That's yeah, that's yeah, really the fun sure. part. It's amazing. We would like choreograph all morning and like use the steady cam, and we there's God one scene in there. We were in what three different rooms and moving all through this like whole mm -hmm. building. Not just um, moving, but you, you, you guys would have these, these, these highs and lows, you know, these, yeah, these like emotional the arcs scene. that were going back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Like the choreography, like the physicality of it was one thing, but then the fact that you guys could, could go up and down so much. And yeah. And, yeah, that, and that's syncing what, that up with the steady cam operator, be, with yeah, sound, exactly. with all these people that are all doing it together. And like if one thing goes wrong, you got to start all over and, you know, mm -hmm. do it again. The fact that everyone was so... Yeah. In sync was really really cool, and it did make for short days sometimes. Because <laughs> <laughs> once you got it, it's like we're not doing yeah. that again. <laughs> um, I, I want to go to you and your questions in a moment, but I, maybe just uh, the last thing I want to ask uh, you guys is, um, what surprised you most about working with Evan? Oh man, <laughs> everything. Um, I mean, just the way that she. Uh, played certain scenes um, you know we were you know it's 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 okay you know you write on the page and you imagine what it's gonna be and after that seeing her play it seeing her and Julia and, and Dennis play the roles is like at some point you're like holy shit like this is really heavy and we actually rewrote the ending of the film while we were shooting because um, her character was so damaged and uh, we felt a responsibility to, I don't know, bring some light to your character, to, to maybe like, you know, turn her arc around. Yeah, which some wasn't kind really of. really in the script that you had first read. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I think we were like, well, we still, we, like, we definitely don't want her like completely off the hook. Like, she's not no. perfect by the end. But yeah, there's a glimmer of. There's a glimmer of. A little of hope. bit of hope. Of something. It's a little bit. Yeah, which I, I agree. I think it's. That would have been just mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it was really the, the, the trust. For me, it was the trust. I mean, you didn't know us. See, we, didn't, we didn't have anything to show you besides like a script and some pictures, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, to, do, to give us the trust to dive into this, you know, 25-day journey um, and the fearlessness and, you know, just the, uh, the openness was, you know, beyond words. And I, I will cherish that and appreciate <laughs> that same, yeah. forever because it really, it really brought what the film is to life and we couldn't have done it without that. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Let's go to you. We have uh, microphones, I believe, on either side of the room. So if you've got a question, put your hand up. Let's go right here to the front row first. Hi, and thanks for coming. Um, I remember you from Touched by an Angel. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that was a great performance. Oh, wow. But you mentioned that in Once and Again, yeah, Once and Again, um, you, were, you were going through um, conversations about your sexuality. Uh -huh. And I remember that we weren't really seeing a lot of young characters like that. So what yeah. was the conversation with the producer's director saying, can you bring this forward? Because you did a great job. Thanks. You and Misha Burton. So yeah. what was that conversation? We were, the f we were the youngest same-sex kiss on television at the time. Yeah. And that episode was also banned in West Virginia. They were not allowed to air it. Woohoo! Just in West Virginia? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, um, but it's amazing to, s to experience that as a teenager and then kind of see where we are now and how television's changed so much. It's really cool. It might not seem like we're making progress, but... We are, slowly. Um, that, um, th the producers called me and my mother into the office and sat us down and just said, you know, we're thinking of having Jesse get a crush on a girl. And um, I, I think we were, you know, again, a pretty open-minded household. They were theater actors, so <laughs> this, is, this is not shocking to them. Um, and my mom was really supportive. Honestly, I have to give a shout out to my mom at this as well because I have been doing this since I was five and she drove me everywhere, stayed on set with me, drove me to the auditions. Uh, she was an acting coach um, and uh, she uh, allowed me to do these roles and these, you know, she didn't 
a judge and she she understood the gravity of them and she understood why they were important. So, you know, while I'm doing once and again in 13 and stuff like that, like my mom was right there, but also letting it happen and letting me do that. And so mm -hmm. I have to kind of give it up to her too for that. Let's go up uh, this right here, yep. Hi. So this September will be my 13th year of doing the festival, and every year there's a seminal movie that I remember always. And at the early part of my, I could say, career of coming to TIFF, it was across the universe. I Aww. was there at the gala, and it was, um, I was so emotional when we gave you a standing O. It, um, it was a very emotional experience for me, and I told everyone, my entire family, this is the best film ever, you have oh, to God. watch this. <laughs> and of course we had the soundtrack, but I was really interested in knowing um, about your preparation for that, what brought you to choose that film, your experience, was there anything special? You don't have to answer all these, just <laughs> pick one. Okay, um, was there anything special that you could tell us about that, that um, experience of the gala, of you know, the audience? So not all those elements, but maybe one of those. <laughs> well, the, that was the first time I ever saw the film was at TIFF. Um, and we worked on that movie for a year. Uh, I, I've been singing since I'd been acting because I started in theater and so I was doing musicals and I'm really like a musical theater geek under all of this. That's, mm -hmm. That is who I am at the core. I'll be singing Into the Woods and Les Mis on the set all the time. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, and I heard that, that, that Julie Tamer was doing a Beatles musical and I was also a hardcore Beatles fan. Um, and I just remember thinking, like, no one else can do this. I won't be able to handle it. Like, I'll never get over it. This is, mm -hmm. no one wants to do this as much as me. And my mother used to tell me the person that wants it the most will get it. So mm -hmm. I was like, I can tell you right now, no one wants this more than <laughs> me. Um, and so I went in and I, and I auditioned for Julie. And I literally had sweat pouring down my back. I was so nervous. Um, and I didn't know, I was like, that either went great or horrible, I don't know. Um, and then I uh, got, got the call later that I was gonna do it and just cried and, um, and then turned 18, moved to New York, I was living on my own for the first time and I was doing a Beatles musical in New York for like a year. And we workshopped it, we, we got together, we sat around tables with our notebooks and we went through all the songs and learned all the different parts and I thought, I already respected the Beatles, but oh my God, their music's so complicated. Um, and getting to learn that and then getting to turn those songs into a story and getting to act those songs was such a wild experience. Um, and so we did that and then we recorded the songs in a studio. So, and we rehearsed the dance numbers. So it was like three months before we even started shooting. And then we recorded everything and we thought, great, we're done. We don't have to worry about the singing anymore. And then Julie said, you know, I've been watching some of these new musicals and I can just tell they're lip syncing, so we're gonna do it live. Ooh. <laughs> so, correction, lame is, you were not the first. <laughs> just saying, you were not. Um, <laughs> uh, so we did, we, put, we had earwigs and, and we did it on set, wow. but it was just, I, I, it was a completely transformative experience. I fell in love with the cast. We're all still friends. Prudence was the maid of honor in my wedding. Um, and Julie's like a, like an adopted mom. She's a fairy godmother. Um, and uh, it was wonderful. And I've since got, gotten to meet Ringo and Paul. I got to watch the movie with Ringo and I got to finally meet Paul. Uh, and that was crazy, but they loved it. Hmm. And I met George Harrison's family too, and they really liked it. And so to all of a sudden have an in with the Beatles was... That's not bad. Really. <laughs> but you know what's crazy is I saw Paul McCartney at a party, right? And mm -hmm. then I'm like, <gasps> and I ran and I left. And in the car, <laughs> on the way home, I'm going like, God, what could you have ever said to that man? What? <laughs> you forgot? I don't know that you're in a Beatles musical, <laughs> that you're Lucy, I don't know, maybe that could have been an icebreaker. And so yeah. I was like, never again, if I ever see him again, I am going up there. And so I did. Excellent. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> what the hell's wrong with me? <laughs> um, but it was one of the most beautiful experiences of my entire life. And that was made with such love and by Beatles fans, for Beatles fans. And um, I still just, every time I see that film, my heart, just as being squeezed because it was just so, so wonderful. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I hope it lasts for a long time. And I hope, you know, we were talking about a sequel at one point, and I was brainstorming with Julie about how we would do it. I don't know if that's ever going to yeah, happen. There's so much more music you could do. Exactly. Yeah. We kind of wanted to do, like, the 10 years later, like, yeah. where are they now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, over here, hey. yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your uh, time with Sleep No More and... Oh my God! <laughs> you know about that! Yes, and uh, how if that experience sort of helped uh, influence your work on Westworld. It was incredible. I don't know, it very much did. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what Sleep No More is. It's an interactive, some people do, yeah. It's an interactive play. So you basically walk into a hotel, you put on a mask, you're not allowed to talk, and you, and there's a about four different storylines going on at once in this hotel and characters running around and you basically have to pick who you want to follow, <clears throat> what story you want to fall into and um, it's incredible and the one in New York was a mixture of the Salem Witch Trials, Macbeth <clears throat> and um, Vertigo <laughs> all, yeah. all intersecting in one story. <clears throat> and it was wild. And when I went to go see it, I like could not get it out of my head. I was obsessed. And no one talks the whole play. It's all done through acting and dance. And dance like I've never seen in my life. Um, it's so hard to explain. But it's like Westworld in that way, where it's like uh, you go into a world and you, it's choose your own adventure and anything can happen. Um, and, uh, and I went and saw it. And they have singers in the, uh, in their kind of speakeasy before the show. And so I, <clears throat> I, I called them and I said, hey, dude, can I sing in the bar? Because I, I just, you know, I sing. <laughs> and they said, actually, do you want to be in the show? And I freaked out. Because sprinkled throughout this play in this building, they have these things called one-on-ones. And so there's characters that hide in these rooms. And every now and then will come out. And they'll grab an audience member. And they'll pull mm -hmm. them into the room alone. And you'll do a scene with this stranger and no one else. Like, it's just for one person. <laughs> Um, and so I learned everything that I needed to do, and then I got put in a room, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I'm just, I'm about to lock myself in a room with a stranger <laughs> in New York on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? Um, so my, the adrenaline was just, oh my, the adrenaline in that show is unbelievable, and getting to do the same scene over and over with a different person, and having it be different every time, and never knowing how the person was gonna react, and they really like work with you. They tell you kind of what to do in case something goes wrong. Like, you know, if somebody thinks, oh, you've taken me into a room, you know, they, they teach you how to hold them and look at them in a way. And like, in my scene, I had to sit somebody down and lift their mask up. And like, in this world, it's like, whoa, I'm really exposed right now. What is going on? And you know, they teach you when you lift it up to look at them like they're the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, to immediately put them at ease and like all the movements and this play are really slow and really sensual and like they're just so detailed in how they direct you to do everything and like how you work with the people. Some people I'd pulled in the room and they'd immediately want to get out. And you're like, <laughs> okay, it was gonna be cool, but like, <laughs> fine. You know, and some people would get really freaked out and really into the scene. One person started crying, I think. Uh, and then I cried with them. Like it's just a really, uh, it's a really, really, interesting way to work and a really interesting way to do theater. I feel like that's kind of the future of, of theater, really, is kind of a more interactive experience like that. Um, so I did it, I think I did the show three times. Yeah, three times. Amazing. Right here, uh, here, yes, go ahead. Hi, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for an interesting conversation that we're having today. Um, my question is about music. I really like your like taste in music, what you've been singing, and uh, like what you post on social media. And um, there's been a project, Rebel in a Basket Case. Yeah. So is it still a thing, or are you planning to do any other uh, recording, something like that? Yes. Yeah, thank uh, you. Rebel in a Basket Case is not a thing anymore. Um, I, it was not, I, I can't make people do what they don't want to do. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to finish out the, the project, but it didn't really work out that way. Um, but it was also time, I think. Um, and so now, yeah, I, I'm, I'm working on solo stuff, and um, I'm going to start performing again in February. Um, I'm actually performing with Bowie's band. What? 
Mm -hmm. Coming up, which is a dream come true for me, uh, the 28th of February yeah. at the Wilton. <laughs> um, I'm just coming in to sing a couple of Bowie songs. So that's like Amazing. a dream, dream no pressure. come true. So there's awesome stuff. Can you tell us what songs you're going to sing? I don't know yet. Don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's like a dream come true. So there's a, there's a lot of really fun um, musical collaborations coming up. I got a show with Zane Carney coming up. Um, so I'm still singing. Yeah, maybe not at the level that Rebel in a Basket Case was. I think it was really hard to do both and to find the time to act and um, be a musician and a mom. So I might keep it a little more local, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm definitely still going to do it, yeah. That's great. Over here. Um, this is all for, uh, for all three of you. In your personal opinions, uh, when you're on set, what is too much and what is not enough direction for an actor? I don't think we had to do too much direction um, on set itself. We had done a good amount of rehearsal. Yeah. And I mean, you guys and Julia and Dennis, I feel you guys really got, I mean, especially the first time you and Julia rehearsed at your place. Um, it was kind of crazy that you guys were really like on the ball right away. Yeah. So I think on set it was more really just finessing it and, you know, a little direction here and mm -hmm. there, but you and know. some things you can't foresee until it's on the day. Like you may yeah. even have an idea of how the scene's gonna go, and then you start doing it, and you think, "Oh no, oh wait, wait, actually, I think it's this." Mm -hmm. And then you try something way out of left field, and it works. Yeah, not. I think it's. I think it's. Um, just follow your gut. You know, it's just how it feels, and maybe it feels completely different than you thought it would, and you got to change some things to make it work, and. I don't know, it's better to, to try things and just go with it and, you yeah. know, push for an extra take maybe and, and, you know, but, you know, respect boundaries and things like that, of course, but we all want to get, we all want to get the best thing out there. So, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a mutual thing. I mean, you mm -hmm. gave as much as we asked for, you know, and we weren't, we weren't asking for more than you were giving. So it's, it's just like this dance a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's all about being in the moment, I think, at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and to create a comfortable it. set. Uh, yeah, so that you are you feel free enough to try yeah. things, for sure. Evan, before you get on set with your 25 years of professional experience, <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how much do you tell directors about how you like to be directed? or, or do, Does that happen up front, or do you just find it in the, in the collaboration? Uh, I find it in the collaboration, and usually I find it, I meet with the director before I say yes to a project if I can. Um, so I can tell that, you know, we're gonna, we speak the same language and, and we're gonna get along. Um, but I've, I, I'm really choosy about the director I work with, so I've been lucky, um, usually very responsive. Yeah, it is, it's, it's like a dance. Do this. Sometimes you, you, you get so into a scene that you slip into your real life <laughs> mm -hmm. and it doesn't work for the scene but it's mm -hmm. so real to you and you're like no this is what she would do <laughs> and they're like no but you're really going too far with this like right. i don't think that's what she would do and and i appreciate when a director can tell mm -hmm. and still gives me the space to do that and then pulls it back because <laughs> a lot of times an actor sometimes you just need to get it out and then you know it's nice when somebody can pick up on that Thank you. Uh, let's go to back here. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rachel. Um, I've been Rachel. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much for being here. Um, I've been a working actor in the last couple of years. The last couple of years. Uh, oh. Hi. And, and uh, what I love when you know, other actors. Too, about the, the script. And then um, I keep to my a lot and I really. Think, but that doesn't mean that it's not actually happening yeah, on another level. It. Yeah, you're like, totally and feeling. somebody asked me the other day, they said, so because you're an actor, do you think you're a better liar? And I said, no, <laughs> I'm a fucking terrible liar. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, like, it's made me a, I'm a no, I'm a bad liar. Um, because when I'm acting, the whole point is to have it be real and to convince yourself that this is really happening so that you give the most honest performance possible. It's not a lie, or it shouldn't feel like one. And so, yeah, on Westworld, I'm, you know, I have guns pointed at me, and that's still a gun pointed at me, you know? And and it leaves an imprint on you and your psyche and and your brain has to process it in a certain way and half of you is, you know, knows that it's fake, but the majority of you is saying, oh, this is really happening, man, let the feelings out. Mm. 
Um, and so that, yeah, there's, you, you need time to detox. I needed time to detox after Laura, for sure. That one was, uh, I could not get out of that wardrobe fast enough on the last day. <laughs> I did not like being her. Um, I respected her and her journey, and I wanted her story to be told, but I was happy to leave her behind. I think that's what makes you one of the greatest actresses, is that you get so deep into <laughs> the characters, you know, to the detriment of your own health. I mean, as a director, it's true. I will. That is the thing. As a director, I will that's exactly what you need. I but I mean, no like, <laughs> that's that's what makes you give these incredible performances. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't come easy. But you guys took good care Without of me. A price. I'm, thank you for not making me get up. <laughs> You're welcome. We've got time for just one or maybe two more questions, if they are quick. Any last questions for? Really quick. Um, okay. Tonally, this is totally different from Allure, which I'm very excited to see tonight. Um, but as you probably know, Practical Magic has a big cult following. It, especially I'm learning that. <laughs> especially amongst millennial women, um, myself included. I recently attended a Halloween screening of Practical Magic really? in Toronto. Uh, yeah, it was are amazing. You serious? It was amazing. Um, awesome. What were some of your highlights of obviously working with two future Oscar winners, um, Sandra and Nicole, <laughs> and running around with them and the man beneath the roses? It was really fun. That was like the biggest movie I'd done at the time. That was like my first like big studio film where I walked into Warner Brothers and like there was a huge set and like Nicole Kidman and Sandra Bullock. That was, it was bizarre, um, but really fun. I'd always wanted to play a witch. Uh, I had, I was like, yes, I want powers. Um, but again, I was like a film geek, so I'm sitting there going, oh my God, it's Diane Weist and Stalker Channing. <laughs> and I'm like 11, I'm like, oh my God, Diane Weist, <gasps> bullets over Broadway. Um, so I think that surprised people. Um, but uh, so uh, it was so fun. We all got really close. We all went on hikes. We. <laughs> We filmed that in um, San Juan Islands, where the orcas are, and uh, actually got to go swim out into the ocean, like right next to an orca, which I don't know if it was safe or not, but I did. Um, yeah, it was just kind of an overwhelming, fun experience, and um, Sandra was really fun, and Nicole was very tall. <laughs> Still is. Very tall. Um, and it, it was weird, because I think there was one year that I got nominated for Golden Globe the f for 13, and I was literally in a category with like three other actresses that I had worked with, or that had played my mom. <laughs> and that was really weird, going from like, wait, wasn't I just, just the weird like uh, niece, and now I'm here, it happened so fast. Uh, but I had a lot of fun on that movie, and I still have the rope. <laughs> I took the rope, the, the, the really? protection rope. That's great. Yeah. Wow. It was itchy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were. Yes, um, guys, we're going to have to wrap it up, unfortunately, but I just want to ask you to join me in thanking the incredible talent up on stage Carlos Sanchez, Jason Sanchez, <laughs> and the amazing Evan Rachel Wood. Thank you. Thanks. Allure is playing at nine o'clock right across the hall in Cinema 2. If you haven't already seen it, make sure you see it. Run downstairs, get a ticket. If you've seen it already, see it again. It's amazing. Thank you so if much. You can. Thanks for coming. <laughs>